I recently heard a talk given by a veteran named Stacy Bear. When he was serving in Iraq, he was assigned to clearing landmines. It's hard for me to imagine an assignment that would be more stressful. He said he also spent a lot of time doing things like kicking down doors and blowing things up. During his tour, he suffered head injuries from explosions and witnessed truly horrible things. When Stacy returned to the U.S., he found himself re-experiencing the awful events, and he had other symptoms of post-traumatic stress syndrome, nightmares, sleeplessness, feeling on edge, and seeing everything through a negative lens. He went on to grad school, but he became heavily addicted to drinking and drugs, trying to escape from his own head. He was depressed and often thought of suicide. He knew he needed help but he didn't know what to do. One day, he called a friend and just asked him what he should do. His friend was blunt. Look, man, he said, I'm tired of hearing about how depressed you are, so just go kill yourself, rejoin the army, or do something about it. This is not the recommended way to talk to a person who's <laughs> depressed and probably suicidal. However, Somehow, it was the shot in the arm that Stacy needed. For some reason, Stacy thought, go climb some rocks. So, he started rock climbing. And that became his do something about it. So one day, he and his brother were hiking in Utah's Canyonlands National Park. Uh, anybody been to southern Utah? And if not, maybe seen pictures of it. So. There are a lot of rocks there, a lot of big ones too. So they, they were hiking on this trail and they started arguing about some trivial thing. And they were climbing up this rocky portion of the trail and just as they neared the top, they both looked up and suddenly right in front of them they saw this huge 150 foot high druid arch. Wow, their jaws dropped open, they completely forgot their disagreement and they just looked at each other and started laughing and hugging. And in that moment came a deep knowing. In that moment, a turning point in Stacy's life happened. He felt that the inner torment that had never left him alone for a moment since he left Iraq, it was somehow ebbing away. In that moment, the power of awe to change his perspective had made itself known to him. And he knew he was on his way to healing. In Western cultures, awe has been associated with transformative religious experiences. In the Christian tradition, some might think of the awe that Paul experienced in his conversion on the road to Damascus with the appearance of Jesus. In Jewish tradition, what might come to mind are the days of awe. Here, the word awe means immense or weighty, the awesome burden to atone and face God's judgment. For practitioners of Earth-centered traditions, experiencing awe in the natural world has always been an integral part of the spiritual experience, and spirituality is an integral part of life. In Native American cultures, a deeply held attitude of reverence and awe for every aspect of the Earth, both living and non-living, is woven into one's very consciousness. Ralph Waldo Emerson, one of the 19th century Unitarian Transcendentalists, was among the first of our religious ancestors to recognize the power of awe that nature could elicit and to connect it with religious experience. In his essay, Nature, Emerson writes, in the woods, we return to reason and faith. There, I feel that nothing can befall me in life, no disgrace, no calamity, which nature cannot repair. Standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part and parcel of God. 
The American naturalist John Muir understood well the power of nature to inspire awe. In a journal entry marked June 6, 1871, he writes, we are now in the mountains and they are in us, kindling enthusiasm, making every nerve quiver, filling every pore and cell of us. Our flesh and blood tabernacle seems transparent as glass to the beauty about us, as if truly an inseparable part of it, thrilling with the air and trees, streams and rocks in the waves of the sun, a part of all nature, immortal, how glorious a conversion so complete and wholesome it is. The thing that awesome experiences seem to have in common is that they point to something beyond our limited selves. Often awe is inspired by a sense of vastness, physical vastness. For example, when we're standing on the ocean's shore or gazing up at a starry sky. The vastness of knowledge and its limitations or temporal vastness, perhaps looking upon the rock formations in the Southwest and contemplating the millions of years in evidence before us. Experiences of awe transcend our understanding of the world around us and perhaps even our capacity to understand. There are big awes and then there are little awes. People say they feel awe in response to more ordinary things like catching a firefly and watching its light blink on and off, witnessing a stranger giving their, their lunch to a homeless person, or gazing into the eyes of a newborn baby. Awe has the power to change the way we view ourselves and the people in our midst, and it can affect our attitudes and perspectives. Dr. Keltner of the Berkeley Interaction Lab has found that regular small bursts of awe lead to a greater sense of humility. Awe seems to take us Westerners out of our preoccupation with ourselves and our own needs and to give rise to the sense of being a small part of a larger whole. Our egos reinforce the illusion that we are separate from everything else. Awe allows us to transcend that illusion and to remind us of the larger things that we're connected to and a part of. Early psychologist William James described awe as an immense elation and freedom that allows the outlines of confining selfhood in our egos to melt down. It momentarily dissolves the self and allows the world and its freshness and novelty to seep in. And when our egos are not so defended, it has a positive effect on how we see those around us. Berkeley social science psychologist Paul Piff found that experiences of awe increase feelings and acts of generosity. In a study, most likely with university students as participants, those who experienced awe cooperated more, shared more resources, and sacrificed more for others, all of which are necessary attributes for healthy communities. The psychologist Abraham Maslow spent time with a Blackfoot community in Siksika in Canada in the 1930s. As with indigenous groups throughout North America, awe and reverence for nature are woven into the community consciousness. In terms of generosity then, perhaps it's not too surprising that Maslow found that to most members of that community, wealth was not important, but rather giving it away is what brought privilege and security. In these two studies of two very different cultures, one, mostly white and middle to upper class Americans and other indigenous North Americans, awe and generosity seem to go hand in hand. Although we need to be careful not to universalize experiences based on studies of small groups of people from specific cultures, in this case, those connections between generosity and awe, they feel right to me as basic basic human responses. Especially in our hyper-individualistic American culture, experiences of awe contribute to altruism because they alter Western people's sense of themselves, replacing it with one that is smaller, humbler, and part of something larger. Even brief experiences of awe, such as being among beautiful tall trees, sometimes called forest bathing, lead people in our dominant society to feel less self-centered and entitled and more attuned to our common humanity. 
These experiences help us balance our gratification of self-interest with a greater concern for others. The power of awe extends into other areas of our lives. It helps people to be more creative and to find novel solutions to problems. Albert Einstein believed that feelings of awe are the source of all true art and science. When Stacey Baer took in the sight of the monumental Druid Arch that day, for whatever reason, he was overcome by awe. And in that experience, he recognized the power of awe to heal his trauma. And with that insight, he also went on to recognize the power of awe to heal others. He began by reaching out to other veterans, and he eventually became the director of Sierra Clubs Outdoors, which sponsors trips for groups. Stacy's goal is to get veterans and other inner city youth out into nature. Many of them have had little experience with the natural world. Simply Staring up into a dark sky full of stars for the first time is often an incredibly awesome experience. Stacy has found that those who experience these trips into the wilderness have an improved sense of well-being, social functioning, and life outlook. Here's a headline, or it should be a headline. Americans are awe-deprived. It's true. As a culture, we spend more and more time indoors, working and commuting, and less time outdoors and with other people. In studies, participants reported having experiences of awe 2.5 times a week on average. Given that the participants were most likely mainly middle to upper class white students, it's worth considering that for groups of people who are marginalized, impoverished, chronically ill, or severely stressed in other ways, for them, the experiences of awe might be even more elusive. But the fact is, for our mental and spiritual well-being, and for the well-being of our communities around us, we need awe every day. So let's think about putting down our devices, taking a break from work, taking a pause and getting outside. There are sources of awe and wonder everywhere if we only look for them. So many opportunities to lift ourselves out of our habituated responses and thinking. I used to suffer with winter depression. Not so much now, but one cold and dreary winter day, I remember I was just casting around for something to lift my spirits. I know that nature often has the power to do that, so I went on the computer looking for images of nature. Now, maybe this was an example of depressed thinking. Yeah, right, because, you know, nature's right down there, but... Not on a screen. Did I mention it was cold <laughs> and dreary and winter? And I lived in the city. And I knew that even looking at images of nature could provide me with a dose of awesomeness. So that day, I discovered the Cloud Appreciation Society. Has anybody heard of this? Well, it's a British organization, and they take a lighthearted approach to clouds. Well, I became a member that day, and they sent me a certificate and a cute little pin and everything. <laughs> And so part of being a member is you can sign up for a daily email. And the daily email includes a spectacular photo. Either it's an unusual cloud or just an awesome picture of a more common cloud, along with the description of what it's called and how it's formed, which helped me appreciate the cloud even more. So I actually found a way to have a few moments of awe every day without even going outside. We are fortunate to live in the Lehigh Valley because we have Blue Mountain to the north, South Mountain to the south, and we have the Lehigh River flowing through it. So I always have the opportunity for a little awe just by looking at the mountains out my window or crossing over the river and looking down. Occasionally, I'm rewarded by something truly spectacular. I'll never forget this one morning. It had just snowed. I looked out my window, and there was like the snow-covered South Mountain, and it just looked like a white blanket with sparkling jewels all over it. Those many doses of awe can make a huge, huge difference. A friend of mine has a big picture window that faces east, and she gets, every, she gets up every morning in time to watch the sunrise. Now, if we're not the morning type, uh, here's a suggestion from author Spencer Scott. I like this one. 
we can take an awe walk in our neighborhood and practice noticing things as if we're seeing them for the very first time. Stacy Baer envisions a day when we'll be prescribed experiences of awe to treat trauma. He predicts you'll get an insurance copay to go river rafting, <laughs> a copay to buy hiking boots, and a copay for season passes to the state and national parks. As he looks at an image of Yosemite National Park, he imagines that our children, when they grow up, will assume that this is our national health care system. <laughs> he is passionate about the power of nature to heal. And why wouldn't he be? It saved his life. And he has witnessed its power to inspire awe and healing in others as well. Whether it's a big awe triggered by a national park experience, or a little awe that comes from watching a tiny ant carrying a teeny little piece of wood. A sense of spiritual wholeness can come from having these experiences on a regular basis. There are lots of sources of awe, but like Stacy Bear, I gravitate toward the power of nature. And while getting outside is the best way to be in nature, you know, sometimes the weather's not too conducive. So watching a nature film or even viewing nature images on a computer screen can bring on those feelings of awe. Have any of you seen the documentary Fantastic Fungi? It's on Netflix? Yeah, wow. You know, they have all these time-lapse fo photos of, of the mushrooms forming. It's, it's very cool. Um, and then there's David Attenborough's films. Has anybody seen his nature films? David Attenborough, he is so enthusiastic and his awe, you know, just comes right through and it's very um, uh, contagious. Anyway, there are lots of other ways to bring awe into our lives. Let's just reflect for a moment. What are some of your memories of awesome moments, big or small? How can you experience more of those moments? It's just one of those things. The more we start looking, the more we can find inspiration for awe just about anywhere. May the power of awe lift our spirits, heal our pain, and inspire us to live with open hearts. May it be so.